brothers and sisters, when revelation first came to the Prophet wasallam, there were some precursors, some cues that it was incoming. Right at the beginning of Sahih al-Bukhari, you find Aisha radiallahu anha saying, the very first thing that happened to the Prophet wasallam in this regard is that he started seeing truthful dreams, accurate visions in his sleep for six months straight. Every time he would see something at night, the very next morning it would come as clear as day. This is what happened in my dream. It's not like, you know, is that a candle or is that the morning time? She says as clear as day. You don't mistake in anything for the daylight. She said, and then being alone, solitude became endeared to him. Allah inspired him with a love of being alone. And so he would go for days and nights at a time to the cave of Hira and spend time there worshiping Allah, attempting to clear himself from the vices of the city. And he would come back and pick up some rations, resources from his wife Khadija radiallahu anha's house and repeat. Until finally Jibreel alayhi salam came to him with the truth and said to him, Iqra. He encountered the mighty archangel who said to him, recite. Recite in the name of your Lord who created. And so he rushed back to his wife's house and he said, the blanket, the blanket, zammiluni, zammiluni, wrap me up, wrap me up quickly. He couldn't stop himself from shivering. And he said, Wallahi ya Khadija, laqad khashitu ala nafsi. Oh Khadija, I swear to you, I feared for myself so much. I was so sure that I was finished. I was going to die or I was going to become insane or something to that effect. I feared for myself. So she said to him, absolutely not. Allah will never disgrace you. You are a man that speaks the truth. You are a man that honors your guests. You are a man that embodies justice. You are a man that speaks up for those that are being exploited and taken advantage of. Come with me. And she brought him to her elderly blind cousin who was an expert in the Hebrew scriptures. And she said to him, listen to my husband, listen to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he listened to him regarding the incident, the encounter in, in the cave with Jibreel alayhi salam. And he said, oh, this is the Namus, this is the messenger angel. It's very obvious. This is the same messenger angel that came down to Musa alayhi salam. Congratulations, you're a prophet, you're a messenger. Of course, he has no idea what a prophet or messenger is. And he said to him, and I knew you were about to emerge. The scripture said you would come, the final messenger. But I never thought you would come out during my lifetime and I wish I was younger so I can defend you when your people drive you out. And the Prophet ﷺ was very confused. Like, how could they drive me out? Like, I am Al-Ameen. Everyone agrees on my nickname. I am the trustworthy person. I am a one who, the man who enjoys a consensus. I am a celebrity in terms of my integrity. I'm born into the noblest family. How can this be? No way. He said to him, no one ever came with your message except that they were turned into an enemy. It was always seen, especially by the elites, as inconvenient. And so a few short days later, Waraka himself dies. The man who would have been his, his consultant, <laughs> the man who would have been his mentor, passes away. And then Jibreel alayhi salam disappears. The revelation interrupted for a period. This is clear. Some say it was weeks, some say it was months, but it was clear that it got interrupted. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emotionally, he neared a breaking point. What happened? Like, did I mess up? Does God hate me now? Like, what has happened? And then the people of Quraysh, he did not go public with his call, but his closer circles, like his uncle Abu Lahab and his wife Umm Jameen and otherwise, would knew about it and they would hear the talk circulating and so they would taunt him. Where's your devil, O Muhammad? Meaning Jibreel Alayhi Salam. Looks like your demon has left you. And so that of course made him feel even heavier. Did I do something that caused God to sort of remove from me the, the friendship with an angel that's about to happen? The communications of the Quran. And just when he was about to break Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah reveals to him Surah Al-Duha. He was deeply distressed. He was so anxious. He was in a dark moment. And then Allah says, Wal-Duha. By the, I swear by the brightness of the day, Allah says. And he was so restless every night, awaiting it. Allah says, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى And I swear by the tranquility of the night. Look at the beauty of what Allah is swearing by in this context. 
And then what is Allah swearing about? He swears by the brightness of the day, optimism, and the tranquility of the night. Don't be restless anymore. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَىٰ I swear that your Lord has not abandoned you. And He has not hated you. He has not detested you. You have not lost favor with God. That's not what this interruption is about. وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَىٰ And I promise you, what's, what is to come is even better than what has already come. That one experience with Jibreel, that one uh, receipt of the Qur'an, what is coming is even more. We're just getting started. So much more good is in store for you in this world. And then there's the akhirah of the hereafter, the afterlife. وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى And your Lord will surely give you until you are pleased. Allahu Akbar, if you just think about your Lord will give you until you are pleased, you know, Musa alayhi salam, arguably the greatest single messenger of all time after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he was given a meeting with Allah, he was told to bring the best of his followers. And then Allah azza wa jal says to him, وَمَا عَجَلَكَ عَنْ قَوْمِكَ يَا مُوسَىٰ O Musa, why did you rush ahead of your people? Why didn't you come with them? He raced ahead of the pack. So Musa alayhi salam says, this is Surah Taha, هُمْ أُولَاءِ عَلَىٰ أَثَرِي They're right here, they're on my trail, they're coming. They'll be right here, O Allah. وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّ لِتَرْضَى And I rushed to you, O my Lord. Couldn't help myself. I rushed to you, my Lord, so that you would be pleased. You, O Allah, would be pleased. But when it came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah is saying, I'm going to keep giving you until you, O Muhammad, are pleased. Can you imagine? What kind of like reassurance, what kind of consolation, what kind of honor and rank the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enjoys? And before I leave this ayah, I must say that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, his cousin and his closest, of his closest companions, members of his household, Ali radiallahu an said, this is actually, because most people say another verse is the most hopeful verse, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. He says, no, this verse is the most hope-filled verse in the book of Allah. Allah will continue to give you until you are pleased because he will never be pleased until his entire ummah goes to Jannah. So when Allah promised to please him, that is hope for every one of us, not just for him. And you know, we have this in the hadith, it is clear. The Prophet ﷺ would stay up at night and cry for us and say, Oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. So Allah Azza wa Jal sent Jibreel ﷺ to ask him, even though Allah knows. But they want us to know this exchange. This exchange is the point of the question. He questioned, oh Muhammad, what's the matter? He said, my ummah, my, I fear for my ummah, them going astray, them being lost, them becoming divided, them becoming misguided, right? I fear for my ummah. Oh Jibreel, tell him, inna sanurdika fi ummatika wala nasu'uk. We will certainly please you regarding your ummah. And we will not disappoint you, oh Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And in another authentic hadith, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kullu ummati yadkhulun al-jannah. All of my ummah will get to go to paradise. إِلَّا مَنْ أَبَى Except those who refuse. They said, who would ever refuse, Ya Rasulullah? O Messenger of God. He said, مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ أَبَى Whomever follows me, accepts to be my follower, follows my lead, establishes their five, respects their parents, gives the charity, stands for justice, right? Whoever follows me goes to paradise. And whomever refuses to follow me, then that is their refusal. It's not a verbalized no or refusing to sign the application. No, you not following me is your refusal. But everyone who chooses to follow has chosen to be part of my ummah and I have chosen to insist upon my Lord, plead with my Lord, get promised by my Lord that my whole ummah goes to Jannah. That's the way it works. However, brothers and sisters, in these last six or seven minutes, I want us to reflect on a particular point. Why is it that the revelation had to interrupt the interim between Iqra and between al duha What is the wisdom there? The scholars often point out that of the most obvious wisdoms was to, uh, to build longing in the Prophet ﷺ, even more longing for the Qur'an. That was the wisdom. It was, in, it was for his own good, for him to become even more filled with earnest and longing and yearning for the Qur'an for it to come down. You know, subhanAllah, so many times we think we know what's good for us. <laughs> and we get so distressed 
and anxious and restless. And we, we, we want to suggest to God how it should be. Right? <laughs> when, when God disagrees with our expectations or God destroys our plans. What if Allah Azza wa destroyed your plans before your plans destroyed you? What if Allah Azza wa Jal departed from your expectations because they're short-sighted and contrary to what you expect is the path for you to ascend and excel? And so this was of the wisdom. This would become even a greater treasure when you have to wait for it a little bit. And likewise, let me draw an important parallel here in this hour. Why does Ramadan have to end? Because if Ramadan did not end, it would not be special. Right or wrong? And so Allah Azza wa Jal, of His great wisdom, even though we say we wish it could be a little longer, I've heard people say it, I've heard my own thoughts say it, we wish it could be extended a little bit more, Allah Azza wa Jal knows. And when you feel a little bit down after Ramadan, remind yourself like this surah reminds us, you haven't fallen from Allah's favor. When things slow down, even in your worship, it is all right. You're not going to be the same after Ramadan. Just don't stop though. You know, the Prophet ﷺ also felt pain because he was separated from the Quran. That wasn't by choice. So don't you dare separate by choice from his book now. You know, many people don't understand where the pain comes from. Yes, there's a natural pain of loving Ramadan, but a part of the pain is self-inflicted. It is because you've been standing and praying and listening and crying and donating. and So your soul actually came to life. The corpse doesn't feel pain, but it's actually because you started becoming alive. There's much more of this. This is just the tip of the iceberg. What's to come is even way more, meaning more alive, more liveliness, more spiritual invigoration, more health of your spiritual heart. All of that is there. It's because of the Quran. So don't voluntarily inflict pain on yourself from, by drifting from the Quran. It's not going to be the same. That's fine. You're going to slow down. That's fine. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, suggestingly, fast six days of shawwal. What does that tell you? It means remove 80%. 20% of the month, six days, fast that much. Don't come to a screeching halt. So like if you're praying 10 rak'ahs, pray, pray two rak'ahs, bring it to 20%. If you were praying two before Ramadan, make it four. That's all. Ramadan will always be special. And the way to build year over year on your Ramadan is just to be a little bit better, no matter what, than you were before Ramadan. Alhamdulillahi wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa nabiyuhu wa rasuluh. Brothers and sisters, in the Eid khutbah, uh, I recall to you that in the verses of fasting, Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَلِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ This fasting is so that you may glorify God for having guided you on the day of Eid and so that you will be grateful. So glorification and gratitude. Now building on that, the one who guided you through Ramadan can guide you after Ramadan. And Surah Al-Duha actually, the very next verses from where we left off, speak to this notion that remembering Allah's previous favors is the way for you to be your best because you assume of Allah the best as you walk out into the future. So many times you're, we're stuck in our problems because we don't recall how many previous problems before this one Allah has already pulled us out of. All we can see is under our feet as they say. And so you miss out on the best of the future, the best opportunities of the future, because you can't recall how much Allah has brought about the best outcome from the past. So the Duha continues and says what? While consoling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alam fa'awa. Hasn't, haven't I found you an orphan? You lost your mom, then you lost your dad, then you lost your grandpa, then you lost your uncle, then you lost your favorite city, everything dear to you, and I sheltered. And didn't Allah find you lost? You didn't know what faith was, you didn't know what the scripture was, and so He guided. And didn't He find you? He found you poor, financially poor, and so He enriched. Look at what you've become. But you know that's not only it. There is a beautiful nuance that the scholars point out in this surah that Allah did not say He found you an orphan. فَآوَاكَ He sheltered you. He said فَآوَا So He sheltered. Because He didn't just shelter you. 
He sheltered you and the world through you. Right? You've become a source of hope for others. Not you have a reason to hope for your own self. You've become a beacon of hope. How many orphans are taken care of because the Prophet ﷺ said, me and the caretaker of the orphan are like this in paradise. People are donating for 1400 years and marrying the widows. And Why? Because of the one that was once an orphan, ﷺ, right? And he found you lost, so he guided. He didn't just guide you, Hadaka. He guided you and guides the world through you. And he found you poor and he enriched, he enriched the world through you. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And so look at what Allah has done for you of guidance and expect the best of Allah in terms of your future guidance. Don't have this grim perception of the future. How? By recognizing how bright the past has been. Hindsight is 2020, as they say. And you know, if I can just recruit this notion, this principle, not just to build on our Ramadan, but for one more point before I close, which is, look at what Allah has used you for, brothers and sisters, in the last six months. Just because it's the easiest example, there is a very famous Israeli historian. His parents are survivors of the Holocaust. His name is Norman Finkelstein. Many of you have, may see his content circulating. This man says, I have been an advocate for this cause. I gave it my life the last 50 years of my life. I've dedicated to the cause of a free Palestine. I didn't get married. I didn't have kids. I don't have savings. I know my books won't sell because they're politically incorrect. And if you were to tell me six months ago that the protests would continue surging and the individuals boycotting would become entire universities, and countries divesting their investments from the apartheid, I would never believe you. If you told me the youth would still be in the streets and the numbers are only increasing, I would never have believed you. You know why? Because the past 50 years, the last half a century, he has seen people wake up and get all loud and go to sleep two, three days later. So now when someone asks, why does it have to be so gut-wrenching? Why does it have to be so raw? Why does it have to take this long? The genocide? Maybe it is because this is what it's going to take for us to finally liberate Palestine. Brothers and sisters, may we see it in our lifetime. May we see it in our lifetime. Allah has already shown us that by His permission, we can make a difference. It, it is already at a point of no return. Walhamdulillah, wallahu akbar. How long it will take? A big part of that is for us to recognize that Allah has chosen us to make a significant difference. May Allah accelerate the unity of this ummah and accelerate the liberation of Palestine and all of the Muslims subjugated in all over the world. May Allah accelerate the collapse of the apartheid regime. May Allah Azza wa Jal continue to blind the strategies of the Zionists. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow us to never sell ourselves short. Ya Rabbal Alameen. And if I were to give you one action item, you may have seen it circulating and I will continue to push it wherever I can. The majority of Muslim organizations in this country nationally have signed on to a strike for Gaza until there is a ceasefire. No life as usual. This Monday, no school, no work, no spending. I lend my voice to that call. Every single one of you, I highly encourage you to take part. We're not going to sleep. We will not get tired. We will not get disillusioned, especially after Allah has shown us what He has shown us in the last six months. We're going to keep pushing. We're going to max out like never before, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. We're going to sustain and we're going to persevere and we're going to liberate the lands of Al-Quds, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. May Allah Azza wa forgive us our sins and perfect His favor upon us and make us instrumental as forces of good and justice in the world and cure our sick and have mercy upon our deceased and accept our martyrs and forgive us for our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen.